And we're live. Good morning, Misfits. You're tuning into another episode of the Misfit Podcast. Three quarters of the Goon Squad in the house. Uh, and the, the one that Ted's knows how to Space record Mountain. the podcast um, is at Space Mountain. Hunter Space said Mountain. he was bumblefucking his way through Space Mountain. Didn't Hunter, they get rid of that? All right, it's a good shot of you, bud. You should just well, you're like fuck, You're like uh, Wilson from Home Improvement right now. That coffee pot right in front of you. All I can yeah. see oh, is your goodness. eyebrows. This is, this is the best. This is the most that people need to see of me. <laughs> On today's episode, we are going to be doing a full recap of quarterfinals. Um, the podcast that you guys listened to last week was all about Hatchet Off Season One. Um, if you haven't checked that out yet, please go do that. It's a pretty good chance that it has already started, depending on when you are listening to this podcast. But before that, the best way to support us, the show, and the athletes that are headed to semifinals is by heading to sharpentheaxeco.com and using your favorite athlete code. You save 10% on your order, and the athletes get 10% towards their journey to semifinals and hopefully beyond. Like I said, there's a really good chance that this podcast is actually being recorded. There was a just recording in the corner, right? That said it, and it says it's uploading. The people are on the screen, Um, so we'll just we'll just say that we're good to go there. I think so. Um, I'm gonna open the floor up to you, Sherb, as the only person on this podcast that did any of the workouts. Correct. Hundred at his house. I saw him in his driveway. I drove by his house. He's in there doing box jumps and wall balls. Score was. Yeah. yeah, they were easy. They were really easy. I beat everybody. Trust me. Fuck. Just put whatever Thirty thousand foot view thoughts, Sherb, on the weekend. I mean, I liked it. <laughs> I mean, in terms of the workouts, I Sick. think it was pretty balanced. Um, you know, I, there are people who have issues with their no max lift or no complex, but like the fourth workout kind of scratches mm-hmm. that itch. So you got, you know, I think you got. Who would uh, win the lift that's at the top? Probably someone named Jeffrey Adler. I mean, the who guy that won workout the open? number four <laughs> worldwide. I'm going to guess Jeffrey Adler. Jeffrey Adler? Yeah. Okay. How many so did he get? That, I didn't see. That, that, 66. 36. 36 reps. <laughs> Take it easy. That's how many I got with 135. <laughs> Wait, did I do it wrong? <laughs> um, no, I mean, I thought the workouts were fun. I, you know, I looked at them at face value and it felt relatively balanced. You got something on the short end, you know, with even though we would classify as medium, I still think the first workout was kind of on the short end in terms of like the output feeling to it, as opposed to like the actual duration of it. I had a mm-hmm. short workout vibe because you're working for three minutes at a time. Um, the second one was obviously my nightmare of a workout. And, you know, it was a, a really good test of both pacing uh, mental resolve and just like willingness to go dark, which, you know, we love to see athletes do. And the third one, uh, was interesting. You know, I don't, it's a, it's a strange workout because obviously we're all racing through that workout, but I think so much of it is personal there. You either kind of have it or you don't. So there's a lot of people who got exposed for having, you know, good capacity, maybe a single movement, but not the compounding effect of all those things or don't understand how those things play off one another, which is the conversation I had with just about everybody talking about the workout. And then the fourth one is just like, can you fucking grip and rip a barbell and can you move well? So I thought it was a good balance test. Um, selfishly, I'd love snatches, handstand walks and shit like that. But like, it was a good work. It were fun workouts. I was happy with how I did. So I had a good time. Hunter. You need a coffee delivery? Yeah. How fast uh, no, is it the window? I'm, I'm, I'm past my allotment. I also, Carter's decided that my clock has been shifted. So it's actually like 6 in the six p.m. for me right now, my body clock. Oh, sick. <laughs> uh, yeah, Perfect. I pretty much echo everything Sherb said as far as the, I thought that, it, you know, it seemed like a balanced test. Uh, I really liked the... Uh, Guess I guess accessibility is probably the right word. I think they did a really good job of ensuring that the workouts were doable by the athletes who qualified, right? We saw we had a lot of athletes at the gym qualify, come in and do some work, do the workouts where I think maybe in previous years certain skills or barbell loadings would have been 
far more prohibitive than they were. Um, and just as something as simple as making that, you know, the final barbell or making, you know, making it a clean and jerk, clean and jerk it anyhow, squat, power, push, jerk, split, jerk, whatever. And then also having that final barbell not necessarily end at that 275, 185, like kind of number that we're typically used to seeing. Um, it's little things like that that I think allow um and i have to assume that there's a large strategy element there too of making the workouts like hey you can do this like a lot more of you qualified this year than they did last year just because of the the numbers and we're making the workouts also like you know to accommodate a slightly larger number of athletes uh both logistically and from a from a you know executability and and actually you know the ability to do the workouts uh to the to the big the most extent you can. Obviously, you're gonna have athletes run into a wall with some of the skill based movements. Um, it's interesting that they jammed all of the skills into one workout, which I think might be my only like critique of the programming. Um, anytime that you you do that, you do have the potential to to see some and maybe and maybe it was intentional maybe it wasn't how workouts one and two were in the first submission window two very different workouts than workouts three and four as far as kind of a you know movement skill sort of fitness i guess perspective but um overall i think that that would probably be my only critique is like you just jam all the skills into one workout i don't and it was still a great test and it's still you know looking at the the leaderboard at the end of the weekend like oh look it's all the same people that you would expect to see at the top of the leaderboard regardless of the division the age group the um the region whatever so uh from in that from that perspective not not to use that as just an excuse it's just like that's confirmation that the programming is well-rounded because the same fittest people we've seen for the last five, even 10 years are in fact at the, still at the top of the leaderboard. It's one of the, one of the ways that Castro and Glassman kind of, you know, originally talked about how that ensures that the programming is effective by the end of the open. You already know who the fittest man and woman on earth is because they won the open and times have changed a a little bit, but not that much. We talked about this yesterday, Drew and I, I think, during the hatchet classes, like the first two were more of like the uh, the gas tank and the engine. Like, what do you have for capacity? And obviously, three and four also test capacity, but they were skill based. Where the first two was just like, how will how far are you willing to push on the rowing machine? How hard or how tough can you be stepping up over and over again with those dumbbells? And then, like on the burpee box jump and the wall ball workouts, basically like we all know you can show off with a five and a half minute round to start the workout can you sustain something like that two more times? And for a lot of athletes, they quickly realized that like they made a grave pacing error. And at that point, sorry, you're in it. And I don't think you're going to want to do this again. Yeah. I, my mind goes a little bit to some of the conversations that we have when we are programming and we're reviewing everyone's workouts as a group. Um, you don't, what's fascinating about these top 10 in the world athletes in their division is Like you can play boggle with the movements and the time domains and all that. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't change anything. You could have had a higher skill movement in number one. You could have had the clean and jerk instead of the wall ball. You know what I mean? With the burpee box jump over, like you could, you could just keep shaking up the movements and the time domains once they were locked in. Um, like almost if you did a hopper with just this, these time domains and movements and it wouldn't matter. But then I would say like maybe 20th through 100th in each region, um, they could have done a little bit of a better job of basically doing that, like shaking it up just a little bit. They were very, there was like a path that each workout very clearly was. Um, and sometimes I think it makes sense, especially the way that they test at semifinals in the games, that they would potentially have more of a crossover there. Um, it's like, this one is this workout. Like a lot of times in competitions, we'll have an argument about like, how do we classify this? Is this muscle endurance? Is this gas? Is this cardio? Is this whatever? And it's hard to know because they're asking for different elements at different times. You might have to go for a long run, very cardio, and then you got to flip the pig, very muscle endurance, and then you got to carry a sandbag and you can't breathe. Right. Um, so they do get to 
they have the the CrossFit has created this world where like people doing CrossFit creates these top ten type athletes, which is absolutely incredible. Um, but I would have liked to see just thinking about Hunter's comment this is a little bit more of a shakeup, like just a little. Yeah, and I but I think again like it it's all about the context of what the the purpose of the test is supposed to be, right? Sure. The open yeah. is supposed to be accessible for the community, but make sure that, you know, all of the right people who are going to go to quarterfinals are because of that number, the number of people. And even from quarterfinals to semifinals, like it's, again, we saw you could, you could, it could be a straight up sprint workout with no skill followed by the you know the burpee box jump over wall ball long workout with no skill a workout with exclusively skill and a workout with exclusively barbells like almost like kind of siloing the you know weightlifting gymnastics monostructural that crossfit does and the same people still shake out to be at the top i understand what you're saying about you know that kind of the fringe maybe the bubble sort of athletes and whatnot but at the same you know you it's I, the the fittest athletes will get to the top, and then I, yeah. you know, we can obviously expect to see something quite a bit different at semifinals, like like and we always do, to make sure the right people get. To as the I've games. said on basically every review show that we've done over the last like five years, this to me sets the beginning of a trend. Not like these were good or bad workouts. Like I th- I think the 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 weekend was programmed well. But it sets a trend for me in that I wouldn't want this to just always be the thing, like the sort of segmented, like, can there be sure. a, a barbell that you got to move in one of these? Can someone, does someone have to show off skill and, you know, more general work capacity in the same workout, that kind of thing. So for me, it just goes into my head because I'm, I analyze the programming very much so through like okay, what are they programming? And then what do we need to program to make people better at it? That kind of thing. Um, right. And I think that from like, just from a selfish standpoint can become boring if it's the same thing year after year. I love that they try to make you go, like think you need to go this way and then they take that turn, right? Like, right. well, there's no lifts at the CrossFit Games anymore. It's sandbags and they do fucking only total like the most classic like here we are and crossfit total is not gone either that's going to be back and then there's going to be a year where they come up with something with rogue that's weird as fuck that's like just pure strength output but not yeah exactly <laughs> just, whatever <laughs> something fucking weird um you know some sort of strongman type element that kind of thing so in my mind i'm just like okay is this a trend is this like a there's the this workout and the this workout and the this workout um but overall, like watching them, um, I, I agree. I think, I think it was good programming. Um, I think it tested a bunch of different things. I thought it was really cool to watch athletes make their way through it because they were so, the workouts were so different, making their way through it, sort of a mindset shift. Um, what am I capable of here? Can you rebound from like, like either hating step ups or hating burpee box jump overs, things like that. Like, can you get your shit together and go show off? Like I do have high skill and I'm going to get back to work next year, that sort of thing. So I thought that was a really cool element of it. Um, the like sort of, I, I have it in a document. It's not super formal, but basically when I'm looking at these workouts and I want to do a debrief with an athlete, it's based on, preparation, strategy, and execution. Those are like the three things that I have. And all of them have a ridiculous spider web coming off of them of what they could even mean. Um, But I thought it would be cool to go workout by workout and talk about how, okay, workout one didn't go well. Like, what does that mean? And how could you prepare for something that could get you into that space? And then when you're thinking about strategy and workouts like this, you know, what would that look like? And then did you actually execute on that strategy? And if you didn't, was it mindset? Was it warm up? Was it, you know, could be all of these different things, right? Or you could just have a strategy and then not do it. Um, we see that on a pretty regular basis with athletes. Um, this was a very unique workout at the top. It was pretty balanced, but it had that, like, if you don't, if you can't, like get a bunch of reps in all three that like walking during shuttle runs vibe to me 
the like <laughs> just just like go get a couple like sure you had someone who had zero snatches in round three and four and got yep. how many total reps like 190 yeah <laughs> i mean i yeah. i in my, in, <laughs> that's my that's gonna be my strategy <laughs> when i did it I, rounds three and four, I did seven snatches in round three and stopped at 30 seconds. And round four, I snatched for 30 seconds and got six and sat on the rower staring at the clock until it ticked over to one minute, knowing that like I could push it harder on the rower than the step ups than I could the barbell. I knew what the barbell was going to do to my gas tank and my willingness to push the row and be able to step up consistently. So I said, fuck that barbell. I'm going to go sit on the rower and right. try to push there. So, I mean, I agree with you, the fittest people, you know, you're trying to punch ticket to semifinals as a top 10, top 20 athlete in the in your region. Like you have to be able to do all things well, but like I know plenty of people who maximize their strengths and just said, I got a good gas tank, but that barbell just fucking smokes me and just yeah. says barbell is almost kind of a throwaway if I can, you know, hit 20 plus calories in the rower and 20 plus step ups. I was very intrigued by. <clears throat> That's an interesting strategy. I don't think I would have thought. How much of well, a step completely... up workout that was because some people still backed off of the snatches and step ups were not like body proportions seem to be quite a thing on that workout. Obviously that workout is it's helpful to be sizable <laughs> in a workout like that. Um, but I just really found it fascinating what people did or did not have the capacity, whether they snatched or not to then do the step ups. I found that to be super fascinating. Um, I don't think that's something where I would have been able to look at an athlete's strengths and weaknesses and kind of, you know, not ignore their size, but like that wouldn't have come into my brain with it being a 20 inch box and fifties and 35s at that level. But like, if you could row pretty hard and then go do step ups for a minute, you had a very safe score no matter what. I mean, I, I, th originally thought it was the exact opposite. I thought you milk the row a bit so you can push the barbell and the step ups a bit more because I just thought the row would tax people too much. And then having wash athletes do it, I immediately pivoted on that plan and like 24 cows, 21 step ups, 23 cows, 22 step ups, 23 cows, 22 step ups. Like you quickly yeah. get almost 50 reps in just those two movements. Right. You get a handful of snatches. You've got a pretty competent score for, you know, Obviously, the best are in the 220s, the 230s, the 240s. Like, those are yeah. the best of the best. But, like, you could get a score around 200 if you just had the appropriate strategy where you maximize what you're good at. And, you know, for the step ups, I wouldn't consider myself very good at those, but I just said, I'm not going to fucking put them down unless they fall out of my hands. And I just went to that point every well, that's single time. Much easier said than done. And you, of, co you of, course, of course, of <laughs> course. Yeah, again, um, I would. You know, I told a lot of myself. athletes not to put the dumbbells down. Of, of course, of course. <laughs> that put the dumbbells down. Um, so this workout, um, we are not insinuating that you should, um, grow six inches to get better at this workout. What are we thinking about as an athlete? So you struggled with this and we're leaving out the strategy as of right now, you struggled with this workout because of your work capacity. What you guys have a remote client that had a perfectly fine strategy and this was their lowest score. What are you doing for them? What are you changing? What are you, you know, sort of thinking about? I'm addressing two areas that I think are limiting factors. Obviously, gas tank. So intervals, bitch work is going to be your best friend if you found that you couldn't go there. Like, you know, if you're someone who does well on a cube test, you're probably going to do pretty well on this workout. If you don't do so well on the cube test, like you're probably not going to do great in this workout. And then I honestly watched a bunch of people fail because of grip strength. Like, are you doing enough grip accessory work so you're actually going to be able to hang on? Because like, pin the dumbbell, like hook grip the dumbbell, pin your hand there and just pray to like Christ that you can go all one whole minute without putting those down. And if that's not possible for you, like you have a deficiency in a part of your fitness where like, obviously it's not a maximal strength issue. Probably it's probably a grip endurance thing. And it is so easy to get better at grip stuff. You just need to spend time doing it. So you're dead hanging, you're holding on to dumbbells, farmers carries. I would say this we athlete- We never program to, any of that stuff, do we? I would say athletes need to spend time doing that. Like that is, is like the easiest thing in the world. It just t takes time. There's also an athlete IQ piece to this, I think, personally. Like when you know how far you can take your grip, 
<laughs> you do some of those farmers carries and like you're positive that there's no way you're picking the dumbbells up again. And there you are after a couple of minutes of rest, staring at a clock 90 seconds into holding dumbbells again. Um, some of the athletes that, that I've worked with in the past where we've done sort of like we, we, are, you know, we do the squat hold, we do your five or seven minutes of squat holds. I'll do the same thing with, with dead hangs from the pull-up bar. And they're just like very seasoned athletes that are blown away by what that feels like to hang from a pull-up bar until you feel literally like something bad might happen if you don't come off of the bar. Um, I think there's, I really think there's something to that. That's the like phenomenon that I found out the first time that I rode an Airdyne. Like your body says you can't even pedal anymore and you actually can sprint still. Um, it's kind of a fascinating phenomenon. And I think grip is one of those things. Like I, I think knowing the different ways that you can feel extremely uncomfortable, um, like, and keep going is, is something that a lot of athletes lack. I would argue a lot of athletes don't do enough grip strength in general. And that's one of the biggest like links in the chain when it comes to why you don't clean more or snatch more so much of those lifts come down to confidence with the barbell. So you don't rush or move improperly. So if you're someone who well, think about them down the chain, what happens when you don't have a good grip on the barbell? What happens to your upper back? What you happens to your upper shit. back rounds? You know, do your shoulders work? Does it transfer to your low back? Like, if you don't feel great pulling the barbell off of the floor, that's also an I issue. mean, I would have argued that if you did like a the strength calipers with all the top CrossFit athletes, you're going to see that they have a clear separation, their ability to squeeze and hold on to something relative to the average population, oh, yeah. like they guard everything else. So it's like you got to think about the time spent and how much that would translate to basically the entire weekend. Like the only I can think like the only workout that that's not going to translate better into is the fucking wall ball and burpee workout. But otherwise, grip workout grip is involved in every single one of the rest of the workouts. And, you know, if you look at a year's worth of programming, probably fucking 80 percent of what you've done for the entire year. Yeah, I think the like grip, the it's one of those rare instances where I'd say like the localized training of like a very specific muscle group is necessary. It's like you could go back pretty much every single open or quarterfinals and find the workout. It's almost like, it's almost like there's a separate category of like grip stamina where it's like the limiting factor here is your grip. Last year it was like, you have to do a bunch of deadlifts and then nine rope climbs. And like the number of athletes we saw who are like, I didn't know I could get that close to failing a rope climb. Um, whether that's intentional or not, it's kind of a, a an interesting nuance to CrossFit, but like the ability, like you guys have said, the ability to hold on to the pull-up bar, to dumbbells, to a barbell, whatever it is, is actually like a very necessary skill slash like element of, fruit. Ele of element of capacity that you have to have to be a competitive CrossFitter. There's never not a workout. And what sucks is that it's often like, one of the gnarlier workouts that you're going to do where it's like that everybody knows that like really shitty combination of grip fatigue and lung capacity of like for me personally like a shoulder burn or like an upper body burn combined with something that's really metabolic um even like open workout the third open workout thruster pull up thruster bar muscle up like just enough like full body to make sure your heart rate's in your throat but a slight bias towards upper body and grip for me personally. But I, I know that's also the case for a lot of athletes. Like the grip fatigue is a huge thing. You guys have already said it as far as like farmers carry dumbbell, kettlebell holds dead hangs from the pull-up bar. Like if those aren't part of your accessory work and training, uh, they should be for sure. It's also just excellent for tendons and ligaments in your forearms and elbows and stuff like that from a longevity standpoint. But, um, the only other one that I might add is Sherb kind of touched on the interval stuff. Um, is I'll, I'll just give another little shout out to something like the MF two work, um, and the zone two, like zone two work, basically teaching your body how to flush waste, even though that's localized, more localized muscle fatigue in like a very, in a, you know, your upper body. Whereas we might recommend, you know, running or, less so rowing but running biking as math or mf2 stuff those even though it is more targeted at your lower body you're you're it's not like your body is just circulating blood in your legs and nowhere else right like this bad. is a full you would die. yeah just a, <laughs> this is a full body like you're you're teaching your entire cardiovascular system to help flush waste your lymphatic system to help flush waste out of those areas and like even if you are 
biking for your mf2 sessions or your zone two work or running like your body will get better at flushing waste even out of your upper extremities i was reading a a hinshaw article the other day that talked about how you know any athlete that he's had really start working on their running their fitness across the board improves their ability to flush waste improves their ability to to recover between intervals recover between you know sets within a metcon all of that stuff improves and we've been talking about that for you know as long as we've been programming math or even you know even longer before that and having the ability to flush waste in a workout like that is is really important yeah, my mind goes to the same sort of trajectory that we use to explain how someone could get significantly better at competitive CrossFit. And that's like really dominating the the, the different pathways through bitch work to start to really understand. Um, I think you can you can learn and make adaptation at a very similar rate um, on machines, which is, I think, a hell of a bang for your buck. Um, and then we move into the interval stuff that you referenced for this workout specifically. Um, I like to sort of blend, you know, maybe starting in the fall quite a bit, start to blend the interval category with the bitch work category. Um, if I'm a remote coach, I might take, um, one of these movements that somebody struggled with a wall ball, a burpee box, jump over, um, a step up and, you know, we've, we've gotten your rowing or your biking where it needs to be. And now we're going to row or bike and then go grab that implement, um, and get to work on that. So that's, you know, still a very dumbed down version of even an interval. Um, and then, you know, then we can add a barbell, then we can add gymnastics and eventually, hopefully by January, February, we're starting to, to really attack Metcons in a way where we feel like we're using that, that, bitch work first, you know, our monostructural conditioning, then we're sprinkling more elements, but still having, you know, the rest period. So intensity is high. I can adjust my strategy, mid workout, that sort of thing. And then eventually when it's go time and you need game speed CrossFit, you've sort of put all of that stuff together. Um, and man, there are some people who sure you'll, you'll laugh at this because you sort of showed the opposite, but there's some people whose movement patterns just don't allow them to use their quads in the same way What's a quad? as other people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, you clearly have enough, enough quad hanging on the front there somehow, um, for Barely. you to be, because those step ups, I mean, you just watch that knee extension <laughs> and you can see the difference between someone who has movement patterns that allow them to develop the quad because there's just so many movements in crossfit where if you're not like really 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 quad dominant then you're going to be in deep fucking trouble um so i just thought that was interesting to watch the kind of person who is very very posterior chain dominant struggle a little bit more with that movement um and obviously in a lot of those cases that person has issues with hip range and ankle range so is it also just that they are uncomfortable stepping up onto a box because they don't have that. Um, but I think those two things sort of go hand in hand and that brings us back to just the idea of your mobility actually being such a huge part of this. It goes pretty well with talking about the grip strength. Like I think, um, you know, that lower half, like if you were uncomfortable stepping up onto that box, it's a pretty low box. Um, and I was so happy you know, it was 20 inches, not 24 hip range and ankle <laughs> range were, you know, necessary <laughs> very enough to be able to do that. A 24 inch box. Oh, mm -hmm. Holy shit. Yeah. Some people were like, I wish it was step overs. I'm like, no <laughs> fucking way. Is it better with step overs? <laughs> Fuck off. Okay. Um, we talked, we already sort of skipped ahead a little bit to strategy here, but I think it is, is important for athletes to know that there's, the way to attack a workout that the absolute best in the world have to, to like dance around at the top of that leaderboard. And then like we're mentioning now, sort of like with the burpee pull-up workout last year, like there are ways to gamify these things. And that's why going into our quarterfinals peaking that, you know, five week block, we told people you have to get back into practicing what is the absolute best score strategy in this workout and not what do I need to work on? What do I need to get better at? Um, 
And I know that can be a tough thing to to do post off season, you know, when you've been told all off season that you need to, you know, row harder than you should in this one, or, you know, go snag a huge set of these gymnastics or whatever, because you're trying to, to, you know, overreach a little bit on them. Um, I know that can be challenging, but if you are sort of fighting for your spot and you know that that barbell is going to fuck you up or something like that, and that you can, you know, I mean, fight gone bad, you don't need to row, right? Like <laughs> there are just workouts that are like that. Um, what would you guys say, um, in terms of giving advice on execution and you can take this in whatever direction you want, but it's really just this, like, this is how I prepared in the off season. This is how I strategized the workout. Like what can be said about the execution portion of this? Cause I, I think it's an important thing to, to talk about. One of the things that I think we all do in our programming with our remote coaching athletes is that every once in a while, we will specifically give the instructions, treat this as if you were trying to get the best score possible, not chasing adaptation. Whereas the bulk of training is more about the adaptation we're after. So the conversation I would have is like, you like these three things. I want you to think about the best possible score or the, what you think is the best possible score on earth. Like, so calculate the 400 time, how long six muscle ups take, how long five power cleans, whatever the workout is. Tell me what you think the best score in the world could be by doing just simple math. And then I want you to strategize to get the clo- score that is close to that as possible. And then after the workout, I want you to evaluate, was this the right strategy? Because it's a muscle that needs to be practiced like anything else. You've got to train the muscle of how to compete and lurking at workouts and doing that. You just can't make that the bulk of a thing. That's kind of like the spectrum of like, if competing's on one end and training's on the other, you, you live more time on the training, but you don't live 100% in one or the other, or you you miss out on something. So I think it's a it's something that needs to be practiced. Depending on how close you are to the season, you might have more practice opportunities than you have, you know, let's just say in like, I don't know, September. But uh, I think it's something that has to be practiced. And if you don't regularly do that, you're not set up to do well when you have to race. I think probably the biggest thing for me aside from like what what Sherb said is valid um is learning to learning to work out by feel um basically you you as a competitor competitive athlete have to know what your line is uh as far as what's too fast and what's too slow and what the ramifications are for going more likely in this case too fast right you do the first round you rip out 20 snatches row 22 calories and then try to hammer out 20 step ups like bad idea right so it's like there there lives somewhere between doing that and saying like oh i'm gonna go ultra conservative and do five snatches and then i'm gonna row my 20 comfortable calories and then see what i can do on the step ups there's somewhere in between those two scenarios lives you and your capacity and in a workout like this, this is very, very much a by feel workout. You extend, you overextend yourself on the grip, like just the grip intensive element, right? You decide that touch and go is a good strategy for you with the barbell, or you row a little bit too hard, or you, you know, you say like, I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm not going to put these dumbbells down ever, but it turns out you were, you spent time standing on top of the box or standing on the ground with time under tension, but not doing any work, um, <laughs> learning how to learning how and when to stop and take a break or rest uh is an important skill and i understand like yeah some of the top scores people weren't resting but you can be damn sure like they weren't it's they weren't going as hard as they could right unless you saw somebody do 20 a minute of unbroken snatches there was some degree of pacing that was part of the snatches unless you saw somebody just sprint for a minute on the rower there was some degree of the athlete knowing what the correct cals per hour for them to hold in order to continue doing this workout and then the same thing with the step ups i would just say that's more of a feel thing it's like if we start going past that point where the dumbbells are sliding out of your hands after 10 reps or, you know, already in the first round, like to me, that's a lack of a lack of kind of being able to be in tune with your body, how it's feeling at the time and being able to adjust on the fly. And we talk about that a lot. And and we kind of talked about it in our strategy and tips that Drew and I talked about. That was a, a halfway point check-in for me sort of workout. Like if you're buried after round two, you're buried. 
if you're like toe in the line after round two, like you're probably doing it right. You have enough to give in rounds three and four, and then obviously you can go in the opposite direction as well. But um, I would say from a strategy perspective, this is a good uh, reminder that you need to be you need to be a smart athlete in the sense that you when you go back into training, there is a big element of going by feel. And we talk a lot about numbers and knowing exactly how many reps you can do in a minute or what an unbroken set feels like or whatever. But there is a also a, a, a significant element of like, hey, what does this feel like? What does it feel like when you're about to fail? Going back to Drew's farmer's carry thing, like, hey, what's, you know, how far can you carry those dumbbells before they legitimately fall out of your hands? And what is the checkpoint where you're like, okay, if I if I pass, you know, if I go past the point of no return, where you know, where is that line for me and how can I tow it well enough to get the best score possible while also being able to play in rounds three and four? The funny thing is you described exactly what I did in that workout in my head. After round one, I was like, that really sucked. But if I back off a couple of snatches, I can repeat that same output on the second two things. And I figured that would be the, the best place to keep my score consistent versus trying to keep the barbell the same. Well, and, and it's also apart. being smart and knowing what you're about to undertake. Because you you mentioned, you talked to me, Sherb, or you texted me. And I don't know if my, it sounds like you might have adopted that mentality where you initially were going to go a little slower on the rower and, mm -hmm. you know, put your money in the in the barbell. And I said, I was like, from my perspective, one power snatch is way more metabolic demand than one calorie on the rower. And if yep. you're a bigger dude, like you can hold the difference between eight and 10 snatches or between 10 and 15 snatches isn't 10 and 15 is probably a big gap, but say like 12 and 15 or 12 and 14, that's not, that is way more metabolic demand than it is worth the two reps that you're going to gain on that station in particular. And for someone comfortable on the rower like you, I think you should maximize the entire minute on the rower, knowing that you might be able to bank 25 cals on, you know, on the rower reasonably comfortably. And that is way fucking easier than 25 step ups. And oh, for sure. <laughs> for, and it's also a different strategy. Mm -hmm. It's all, it goes to a different strategy for the ladies. I think that's a, something that we missed is the, there is a difference in this workout ladies to men, especially because the rower count, like the ladies just aren't going to accumulate quite as many calories on the rower, but we saw generally a higher barbell count. And in a lot of, in a lot of instances, more step ups from the ladies side. So it was almost like opposite sort of recommendations, but it still goes to like, what what is the correct strategy? What's the you know what's the mathematic? What's the, what what's the math behind this? What's the what's the demand of one rep versus one rep versus one rep? One thing that's cool about the sport um, is sometimes you do run into people that are like pretty high level athletes, and they're like, yeah, I didn't play like organized sports growing up. Or I didn't, I never like got into weightlifting or running or anything like that. Um, but what can be challenging in those instances are you train in your gym year round. Um, and the, there's, there's no real like competitive environment. And then this thing is looming on you. And I really think there are a lot of people that don't know how to deal with, like, we'll just call them butterflies because like you call them nerves or you call them stress. We start to get into <clears throat> negative connotation. You call it adrenaline. It seems to be a, a positive connotation in a lot of ways. Um, and some conversations that I have surrounding this stuff is like, did you expect not to be nervous? Like, like if you're judging the shit out of it, if you're like, I'm nervous because I'm not good and I didn't prepare and I've never been good in competition or I'm bad at online competitions or whatever, whatever narrative that honestly probably someone else sold you first and then you decided to to take it over yourself. Um, Easy way out. Well, but it's, it's I think people aren't it's seeing a subconscious it through. Element too. Yeah, yeah. I don't think people are, they're seeing it through completely different lenses. They're, they're standing in different shoes. They've, again, these, these narratives that they've been fed, that they've had, um, you know, sort of adopted on their own without knowing that they've adopted them on their own. It's kind of fascinating. Like I just, I can sit here right now and call back on all of my experiences, like playing sports. And I could conjure up that feeling 
like literally right now. And it makes me want to like slap the wall or like, you know, fucking scream or go do whatever. Like there's just such a positive connotation from so many years of doing that, of that feeling. Like fucking finally, Jesus. Like if I was a CrossFitter, you jammed me into a gym for 10 months and finally let me go outside and run around, like I'd be very happy. I would love that. But in the same way, if you think about it in the opposite direction, like, okay, it's been a year of all this work. What if I'm not that? What if I'm not what I think I am? What if this has all been made up? What if the people in my corner are blowing smoke up my ass and I'm not capable of doing this? And why are they putting those expectations on me? You know, that sort of thing. The, the two sides to this coin are, are, I think, extremely, extremely fascinating in figuring out why you judge the nerves or the butterflies so much, um, I think, is a missing element from someone being on a completely different page of the leaderboard. Like you can take an athlete who just has the most incredibly well-rounded um situation um energy system skill you know all this but if, if this stuff comes up and you don't buy into what i would consider the truth then you're gonna have a problem like some people will tell you they're not tough and they love like five minute repeats on machines and it's like shut the fuck up like nobody suffers the way that you do in bitch work how does that extrapolate out to one week later well i'm just not that tough like i can't really go there it's like, um, I'm not fucking, I'm not buying that at all. I don't disagree. <laughs> I really don't. I think it's a nice button. On workout number two. Everybody's favorite workout. It's easy. Of quarterfinals. Um, just jump right into preparation. What do you do for this workout? Um, and I will tell a little, a little story as a, as a preface to get us started. Um, I had a conversation with an athlete yesterday that was like, you don't want to be the athlete that says, I got a pretty good chance of qualifying if there's no burpee box jump overs. <laughs> like you never want to be that athlete. You want to yeah, be I the agree. athlete. Yeah, go <laughs> Agreed. You want to be the athlete that like, Hear there are some out. athletes don't realize how much. <laughs> as long as that bar is 95, 75 right? maybe or less. And yeah. we're good to go. Easy and day. athletes are like, so, so many athletes at the highest level are very humble. So like the programming will come out one year and the, and it'll be super well-rounded and they'll go, it's fucking wheelhouse for me. Like I'm so lucky. And it's like, no, no, you're not. You're like insanely fit. That's what the answer to that question is. You're always trending towards being fucking silly enough to think that well-rounded program is wheelhouse for you. Um, you know, I think we'll take that any day. But the cool thing about this is if I'm in pursuit of getting someone's step ups in order and workout number one, or their wall balls or their burpee box jump overs and number two, it does not matter if they come up again. If that is a major hole, something is very wrong with your mobility or your work capacity or your skill within a movement. And to be you know, sort of just wondering what level you can compete at in a worldwide competition, the ability to make a significant change to anything will have huge ramifications on everything else that you do. So like if you can figure out, even if you over bias a little bit, if you can figure out how to like, you know, slay the dragon when it comes to these movements, everything else is going to get a lot better. And I think the step ups and the burpee box jump overs are just great examples of that because like, what would you have to do to get really good at step ups or burpee do box jumpers? Do them. <laughs> Just do them. Do a I lot mean, of honestly, them and get fit at the same time. Yeah, I mean, I actually had someone reach out to me. It was like, do you think I'm not strong enough to do wall balls? And that's why I did bad in this workout. I'm like, no, you don't do enough fucking wall yeah, balls. Like <laughs> yeah, you can't throw a 20 pound pillow and do an air squat fucking 10 feet. Shut the fuck up and do wall balls until you don't like, you don't fucking care you're doing wall balls. I mean, we've literally done that with athletes here. It's like, Hey, you hate thrusters. Every time you come to the gym, you're going to warm up and you do three sets of 20. Start with the fucking empty barbell and build your way up. a conversation Sherb had with a 56-year-old woman at the affiliate. Slap the shit out of them. her. She was like, I'm This is actually a conversation Hunter through. had two weeks ago with Sherb about double unders. Um, <laughs> yeah, fuck. Just fucking do them. The, the, wall balls, the, the wall balls are so easy. Do 50 before every single session you do. Do them as your warm-up. 
It's no different than the 2K row thing. You do them every time until you do not care that 50 reps is 50 reps. So that way, when you go to a workout, you don't care if it's fucking five wall balls, 50 wall balls, or 500 wall balls. Just keep fucking doing them until you don't care. That's honestly the easiest thing with burpees. It worked for me with some of the gymnastics movements like handstand pushups and chest to bar pull ups. Like you just gotta keep doing them. If you can't, you can't bitch that something's not, you're not good at something if you don't practice it. So like if you suck your burpee box jump over, it's like, I'm sorry, but you need to do more of them. And you know, if you're like, I can't figure this out, well, maybe you reach out to somebody and say, all right, can you look at the way I'm doing this? Is there something wrong? Because there can be a technical element, but for a lot of athletes, it's just exposure. You don't do them enough. I think the exposure helps with the technical element just from the point of understanding what <clears throat> is going wrong. You talk to enough people in a gym, you're going to figure out like, or you watch enough people move and then you go. Because if you're, if you're like pounding your head against the wall, especially with a burpee box jump over, there's a decent amount of technique um, in terms of, you know, how much you know, movement costs can change incredibly. Like I watched multiple people stand almost all the way up at, on top of the box or their break before their next rep was to stand all the way up, open at the hip and then go back down. And like, there's just these things just where it's like, we do enough snatch workouts and burpee workouts and thruster workouts to know that like you moving your body long distances is going to be a problem for your heart rate in a workout like this. So, um, you would hope that if someone worked on them enough that they would get that. But I do think that there is a pretty big technical element when it comes to some of these movements. But I think the exposure usually puts a magnifying glass on those. I mean, I, well, I had the conversation. Think, oh, go ahead, Hunter, go ahead. Uh, I just it was going to say like the, expo the, someone says they're like, so you've got a fit athlete who's good at most things except for this one thing. It's like, well, what exact part of that one thing is it? Because if I tell you to do one burpee box jump over, that person's like, are you fucking kidding me? It's like, okay, well, what about 10 of them? It's like, okay, no, nope, that's fine. What about 20 of them? It's like, okay, that's when I start to that. Like, I don't like that. I don't want that anymore. It's like, try, we got to figure out exactly what element of that thing is giving you grief. Is it for a burpee box jump over? Is it that like, I don't know what the fuck to do with my feet, so I spend a bunch of extra energy taking steps that I don't need. Is it an efficiency thing? Is it the burpee gets tough, like I my back starts to get tight because I worm myself off the ground and then I catch myself in the bottom of a, a shit position on top of the box. My back gets tight, so I hate the movement. Is it I don't know how to pace them, so my heart rate gets too high too quickly and it makes the rest of the 50 fucking miserable, right? It's not... The odds that it's just what it's the whole movement. It's like it's not the whole movement. There has to be some element of it, like identify the very specific element. If it's a wall ball, it's like my shoulders get tired. It's like okay, well let's figure out why. Is that the because your your T spine's tight? You can't get in an upright position. Is it because you're holding the ball like you're trying to fucking squeeze a you know a a, a fucking orange over a bowl? Like what are we? The odds are there's some element of how you're doing the movement that is poor, especially if you have good fitness everywhere else. If you like, it's like. I don't like burpees. I don't like box jumps. I don't like wall balls. I don't like double unders. I don't like rowing. Damn. All of a sudden My we're list. starting to say like, oh, got it. You don't like bitch work. You don't like the, you know, the engine stuff, that sort of thing. And that's usually somebody who just needs to improve their overall fitness. You need constantly varied functional movement at high intensity, Play violin. not, you know, uh, it, this exposure program to do, you know, zero to 150 wall balls, that sort of thing. So depends on who the athlete is, but I think an important element of like figuring out a very specific movement is like, what is it about that movement specifically that gives you so much grief? Our segue to strategy is, did you just do them at absurdly varying paces throughout the workout? Like, right. yes, you did. The biggest athlete IQ question of, I think the entire quarterfinals is, or was, what is your 15 minutes of burpee box jump over pace? <laughs> that Lighting is a fast. massive fucking question, right? Some athletes were doing 16 a minute. Some athletes were doing eight a minute. That is a, that's a variance right there. That is a massive swing in how many reps you can accumulate. Um, 
And I watched a lot of athletes just, just the, the whole reason they got their score is because they did a whatever five minute round to open and paid for it for the rest of the workout. They weren't able to get themselves back until round three. And at that point it was just too late. I mean, thinking about the workout, like the quick math on it, like if you were able to do the, um, if you're looking to finish this under 20 minutes, right? That's 640 around. Yeah. 640 around will get you finishing the workout at exactly 20 minutes. I saw athletes go through the wall balls and think about them as like, all right, I'll do them in two minutes. That gives me four and a half, 440 to finish my burby box jump overs. And then the first 20 reps had done, you know, first 20 reps of burby box jump overs, it spent 90 seconds. That's just like, that isn't it. So when I went into this workout- So many people did that. Well, when I went to this workout, I watched someone go directly before me. His name's Kyle, and he's got a very, this is a like dream quarterfinals workout for him. He's got an awesome engine. He's very tough. Um, but execution error was just simply pacing. He finished round one at like 545. And I was just like, ooh, Easy. that's pro-. I was like, that's probably about 30 seconds too fast. He finishes round two. It takes him, I want to say about eight minutes, right? And I'm like, oh, I don't think he's got. I don't think he's got a six minute round in him to finish. He just didn't have it because he went too fast. So following him right after him, I'm like, all right, I'm going to try to finish around 610. I finished at like 608 for the first round. And then I got done and I was like, all right. Or no, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Six, yeah, 608. I was like, that's probably still a little fast. I knew the middle round was going to be the, the sticking point for a lot of people. It's like, how far do you fall off in round two relative to round one? Because most people can see the light at the end of the tunnel in a workout like that and kind of push at the very end. It's what's that middle round look like? And after the middle round, I broke up the wall balls more. I went slow on the burby box jump overs, but I was still like, I think I had 13, 18 was the end of my second round. So like two seconds ahead of pace because 13, 20 would be two rounds at 640 around. And I was like, all right, as long as I'm not a baby on the wall balls and I don't blow the fuck up on the burby box jump overs, I have a chance. And personally, I found because I like wall balls, again, that's part of it's like the psychology of it, but also because of the rhythm of it. Wall balls after 15 reps began to bring my heart rate back down a little bit and put me back in control. So you do, I did four sets of wall balls the last two rounds. It got me in control enough that I knew that if I just started moving on the box jump overs, even though I was crawling for the first 26 of them, that I had a chance because I knew I could pick it up at the end. And I think having played it out, it basically goes round one's your fastest round, round two's your slowest round, and round three is typically a little bit faster than round two, but maybe not quite as fast as round one. And I think that's the strategy that most of the athletes who had successful goes to that workout executed on that workout. And that's simply just realizing like sort of what you're saying in the last workout, it's feel. You have to know what that feeling feels like and to stop calculated before that point so you don't cross that line because once you cross the line, the workout's over and you're just playing survival mode at that point. And you need ownership of that concept. <clears throat> the idea that you need to only watch YouTube videos to find out what your strategy is going to be or Hunter, you're my remote coach. You tell me exactly what my sets and reps are and what my targets are. And I'm not going to adapt mid workout. Like you don't know how I'm feeling today. You don't know how my warm up was. You don't know oh, X, Y, and Z. Like you need, there is a level of ownership of knowing what something is supposed to feel like. Um, and man, this like, this is the exact reason why we're not going to shut the fuck up ever about athlete IQ. If you didn't have it in round one of this workout, you... It'll come to you. It'll come to you for sure. It's on its way. Go ahead. You might <laughs> it's, have... It's coming. It's on the other side of that box. Fucked your whole season up, right? Yeah. Just That's a, a five-minute chunk. Your spot on the leaderboard not being reflective of your fitness level could have been, I don't know what the first five minutes of a 20 minute workout is supposed to feel like, like to me, like there's a reason why it's not just the programming, right? Like us sitting on here talking about this stuff, like no one else is going to fucking listen to us have these conversations. So we might as well say them into a fucking microphone, right? If we walk ah! out into the gym and <laughs> had these conversations, people glaze over in about two seconds. Um, this is our, this is our safe space, um, for being fucking nerds. But, uh, yeah, I just, just looking at this workout and watching so many people do it. There was this, like the exact example you gave. Sure. But I watch people here. I'm like, this person's going to crush this workout relative to, you know, sort of who they're competing with. Not necessarily the case. Just didn't, just didn't think about it. 
<laughs> only thing I want to add to this workout before we move on is the there was a workout. Sherb will remember this probably like two months ago on main site, two maybe three months ago. AMRAP ten minutes burpee box jump overs. Wow. So if you're a competitive <laughs> CrossFitter and you don't pay attention to main site, like imagine that workout. Imagine that you did pay attention to main site and that workout came up and you thought to yourself like, what am I? What would I get in that? Do I hold? Do I get a hundred reps? Do I hold ten burpee box jump overs a minute? Can I hold twelve or fifteen reps and like, lo and behold, that total number is not that far off from quarterfinals. So whether that was intentional or not, I don't know. But I um, bet it was. If you're a competitive CrossFitter, like, and you don't pay attention to the main site programming, shame on you. You you can't you can't ask people to run. You can't ask people to use multiple machines. What are they going to ask for? I have an idea. <laughs> right. Um, Power snatch. We are going to go a little bit faster mm -hmm. on on workout three and four. I know you got to take off, Hunter. I don't know if you have... I'll bounce at like 13 minutes from now, like 10 minutes got from it. now. Cool. So workout number three, um, <laughs> preparation here. Uh, did you fix the way that you moved? <laughs> um, and maybe you understand most fatigue? <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't know, though. These kind of workouts... They really do, like, within maybe a minute swing shake out. Like, I saw some people take some real fucking chances and just barely squeak through, and then someone else took those chances and didn't. But it, it, what happened was probably what was supposed to happen because of movement efficiency more than anything. I think enough people saw basically everyone breaking up everything from the beginning to know that at every level it's okay to take breaks in this workout. But, um, man, the rope climbs, the fucking rope <laughs> climbs, people that climb the rope efficiently looked fine on the muscle ups. The people who we had an athlete change his shoes and knock a minute off because he was like, I could not get a fucking lock in the shoes that I was wearing with the rope. Cause we just talked Stop about them. like what, what went wrong here. And it's like, he's like, I, I haven't climbed rope much in these shoes. And I guess they're just not great. Fucking slapped on another pair of shoes and went from, I think nine fifty to nine right around that level. And it was just like, it was so much easier to do. He was able to go in and do four sets of five on the was muscle. Was it actually the shoes or did he, was his strategy different? We talked about the fact that the separator was for me watching people do the rope climbs. If they went up the rope the way that they were supposed to and they were mm -hmm. at a high enough level, the muscle ups looked pretty smooth. Four or five yeah. sets for basically all of them. Um, and he was like, yeah, I just, I felt like shit on the rope climbs and I felt like my feet were slipping the entire time. And probably makes the I most don't... sense. I mean, that you spend the most time on that movement out of all of the others yeah. aside from the muscle ups. And we talked about the, the, you know, the workout <laughs> just funneling to the muscle ups. Um, yeah. The, the movement efficiency thing is obviously the, is priority number one. Like, did you not only, not only do you move well in the individual movements, but are you able to physically get into the positions that are optimal for that? So like, imagine that you do kip well, but, for whatever reason, you're super overextended on the top of every handstand pushup. You use your hips effectively, but you end in a poor position. Cumulative effect there is like, okay, my low back's tight from handstand pushups. Now I need the opposite motor pattern, the lifting of the knees, the use of the low back and the psoas on your rope climbs. And then lo and behold, that has just been detonated by rope climbs. And now you, you have no turnover in your muscle up. Like, I think for the most part, everybody identified that the, the workout was designed to be muscular fatigue and it's one of those I, I don't i guess we were maybe before we were on air while sure was mentioning this because we we always joke with athletes and just kind of internally like the run your own race sort of thing is is dumb in competition when, it, when it's like you're not running your own race like you need to race against the people that you're <laughs> racing against but i do think that there is a like there's an exception to every rule and workouts like this is definitely one of them. Like I cannot, like I am not going to run Ryan McKay's race on the burpee box jump over wall ball workout. I am not going to like, you know, say, and with gymnastics, that was probably a bad example. The muscle up, the gym, the gymnastics right. one, um, like 
you need to be able to run kind of your own race as far as like knowing what your capacity is in those movements because there is like that line kind of a fine line between leaning forward and bending over when it comes to gymnastics and muscular fatigue and you you lean a little bit too forward too far forward and yeah there are athletes that have absurd capacity in shitty movement patterns and they think that because in a a couplet where there's no interference you know maybe it's running and toast to bar or something like that but they're doing better than someone who moves well it's like well you you very fit um have pretty good muscle endurance move like shit when you run interference throughout the entire workout like this this yeah. is when you see the best athletes in the world failing muscle ups or legless rope climb whatever it is at the crossfit games um and the other person just taking an extra second jumping up and being able to finish the workout um and everything leading to that moment looks exactly the same and then you look at the end of the weekend and it's not a surprise that like you know tia Toomey's had so many moments like that where we're wondering as she entered the rig um in madison before running across the grass who's gonna you know it's her and it's Haley adams it's whoever they all enter at a very similar time and then su fucking surprise surprise it's a five minute workout 15 minute workout 25 minute workout who shoots out of the rig and runs across the field first fucking arms pumping in the air who's the one that does that right and that's because the movement efficiency is also there it's this huge piece of the puzzle um and you know there are moments where it matters more than others, but in this type of workout where they're just, it's just this massive instance of running interference here. Like if you don't move well, if you didn't actually look at the skill column, you know, in your program and say, this is skill work and not like showing off my max set of toes to bar, um, then that's what changes at this moment. And that's like a challenging mindset to have over the course of an entire year fine tuning certain skills that you feel like you have capacity in, but in reality compared to other people, you might not. Um, but yeah, this, this workout, just thinking about how you would prepare an athlete to do better and at what their strategy would be like, what can be said other than use your fucking brain and you need to move better. Like those I think are last thing would be discipline too. Like one of the things we've done in skill work throughout the year is say, here, you have to do this many reps. I want you to pay attention to how long you take of a rest between movements. Like I think of someone like Kenzie doing that workout, like none of the movement sets I think would be ultra impressive in terms of volume, but like every time she came down from something, there would be a, a timer in her head going one, two, three, and she'd be back up into the next movement there. So I think that's another thing that could be practiced in something like this is knowing what your forever sets are and being ultra disciplined with rest periods because you know, that's one thing I definitely was guilty of in this workout is I played it, I think, pretty safe. And then I came down from the muscle ups and I, you know, I'm kicking myself a little bit about the time that I had. And it was because I gave myself these crazy long breaks between muscle ups because I was unsure of what I should do there. So, like, I think that's also something that can be trained there is discipline in, in rest periods and realizing what you think is three is probably 12 to 15 seconds. That goes to the feel thing too and the discipline right combined together. It's like you might actually have the right strategy. You're going to say, I'm going to do 10, 6, 4 on the toes to bar. And it's like, okay, great. That sounds like a good strategy for this workout. And in the second set of toes to bar, it's like, man, my grip is starting to get tired before this set of 10 because you've worked out four times before this, you know, over the weekend. You're just generally more fatigued. And instead of saying like, this is bullshit. Like I should be able to do that. Like ten <laughs> six four. It's like, no, it's like, that's fine. No, no, no amount of fitness has changed over the last 72 hours. You're probably just a little fatigued, but it doesn't matter. The point is like, make that adjustment on the fly, have the discipline to say like, actually this 10, the set of 10 is like going to be a bad idea for me later in this workout. So I'm going to take an additional rest period. And then you tack on the discipline element of now that I just added a set, I need to be even more disciplined about the rest period I take between these reps. Um, just because you're, you know, you're smart enough to know like, okay, I'm not going to push that past that line of muscular failure. And that means if I break things up a little bit more, I just need to be a little bit more disciplined with rest. Imagine caring about your placement on the leaderboard in competitive CrossFit and not figuring out what to do about your shoulder mobility. Like I just, <laughs> yeah, I mean, underneath the, like the, there's the, it's like, we talk about movement efficiency, but like 
the the foundation that is holding that up <laughs> is your mobility, right? It's like you can there are some sports where you can like, hey, we're going to figure out how to make a movement pattern work based on the mobility or whatever that you have in CrossFit where it's like the sport is getting yourself into the correct and most efficient positions in order to do the most work in the least amount of time. If you're skipping over that, you're just like, you're just smashing your head into the wall. Yeah. You think to like, you have ankles, knees, hips, shoulders, elbows, and wrists. Get your shit together. Like, Make them work have, correctly. Yeah. If you have a major problem in any of those places, you're just not going to have access to what your body would be capable of doing. Okay, last but not least, we have workout number four. Um, Hunter, you're you're taking off, so I'll let you say your piece about workout number four. Obviously not the most complicated thing in the world, but I think a, a fun show of that Venn diagram of fitness and strength. Yeah, I think this is the one that is like, again, not a, this is not a run your own race sort of thing, but like also not trying to go, you know, if I try to keep up with Sherb in this workout, I'm probably going to have a bad time. Um, and it's just kind know, of knowing me? that line for you. And then uh, again, a bit of an athlete IQ thing here. What I liked was that the barbell ended at a, at a more accessible weight. Um, and then we still had kind of those heavier checkpoints in between, but identifying where the sticking point is in a workout like that. And then again, going to something as simple as like, okay, for me, I know that this workout is challenging. I've done workouts with five clean and jerks at 225 in them as an AMRAP before. And I know roughly like what cadence I can hold on that workout. I know for me that like anytime I do a an EMOM of clean and jerks, like two reps takes me, you know, X amount of time, basically using the clock to your advantage and saying like, I'm going to do a clean and jerk every 10 seconds on that second barbell. And then I'm going to do a clean and jerk every 15 seconds on the second barbell. And when you start to do that, especially in this workout where there was only 30 reps that kind of led you into that final barbell, you actually find that like, as long as you're pretty consistent on those first three barbells, you're going to have a very similar amount of time on that final barbell, which is what we saw. You know, pretty much everybody had that like four to five, maybe a little bit more minutes to do those clean and jerks. And from there, it just became like, okay, there is a strength limitation here, but it's like the right blend of fitness and strength. What is the cadence for you on this barbell that's going to allow you to clean and jerk from that five and a half minute mark until the 10 and a half, until the 10 minute mark on the clock? Do you need to be prepared to go to a squat clean at some point? Which I didn't see as much of, but we did see a lot of is going to a split jerk just because athletes were starting to get a little wobbly with a push jerk and a split jerk seemed to be more effective and much more of a kind of a, a sure thing as far as completion of the rep. And at the highest levels, we come back to similar levels of strength and fitness and dare I say mobility and movement efficiency are the things that are separators, right? When you watch everything, I watched a 25 rep and like a 30 rep. And if you were just kind of walking around the gym as a coach, you wouldn't notice the difference. Um, in terms of cadence, they didn't really look that much different because a lot of the people, you know, snagged a few extra at the beginning and then settled in. So it's like, okay, what is causing those things to happen? Those extra, honestly, multiple seconds of like, am I wobbling around? Am I walking around the gym? Do I need an extra second to like lock this barbell out and gather my feet, do that sort of thing. Um, and those things very much can be both mobility and movement efficiency. You typically see, um, one or the other in a lot of athletes. Um, because again, when the mobility is the issue, there's not really much of a high expectation of a movement like that looking fantastic. Like we, you, you, we all sort of know what it's like if somebody doesn't have the hip or ankle range and struggles with thoracic spine mobility, you know, that He's front right, right position. Here. I got T spine mobility for days, kid, just nothing from the waist down. If I click leave on this app, Drew, am I going to delete the podcast? Yep. Um, it said, I don't, I don't know. It says you're ninety nine percent uploaded. I think you can leave, but leave the window open. This is the All content right, that. that people ask for. All right. Bye, Hunter. Thank you. Bye, boys. <laughs>
Um, Fuck. How did you feel about this workout? So I got to, this was the only one that I got to see you do. Um, mm. I was glad that, because honestly, the first three barbells for most athletes is just like, sorry, but you have to get these done as fast as possible because not like backing off you, you the time that you're getting back um, or the time that you're not getting back is just too much to overcome um, when it comes to that. So I was glad to see you decide to, to buy into those first barbells early. Well, one thing I didn't do during the open that I sort of kicked myself for not doing during the open, but after was like redoing any of the workouts, even though I thought I probably could have done better. I was a little sick during the open. So like part of that was just like, I don't feel good. I don't want to keep doing this. So when I I had a hundred people sign up, (laughs) yeah, Yeah. 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 a little little busy. Um, but like when I did it over here, one of the things that annoyed me, you know, we have high temp plates here. We don't have any competition plates. The bar was bouncing a bit and I was chasing it. And like, I just thought to myself, like I was kind of quick, but it was also 7am Saturday morning, which is the time that I did the workout, which sure probably isn't the most advantageous time to do it. So like there were things that went into my performance that I was like, ah, not only could I gone a little faster in the first three barbells, but like I also was way too calculated and slow on the 245 barbell and I stuck to push jerks the entire time. So every rep that I did was a power clean to push jerk where I tried to like catch it in the dip and go right into the jerk. And I think that was just metabolically inefficient. So going in with a strategy, if I can go a little bit faster in the beginning of the workout and I'm going to try to split jerk these and see how they felt. Like, I don't know how my split jerks looked, but they felt pretty secure in terms of like, I never had any wobbly ones where when I did the push jerks, I probably had three or four reps where I was fighting myself to try to stand them up. So, um, you know, I felt really good through the first two barbells. They're basically the almost exact same amount of time spent on the first two. It's probably like maybe 10 seconds slower in 185 than I was 135. 225 felt good, but I had almost, well, I actually had over a full minute more on the final barbell in the retest versus the first time around. So like you and I had discussed, if you get there, it becomes a simple math equation. What many reps do you want? How much time is left? That becomes your every 10 seconds, every 15 seconds, every 20 seconds, depending on what your goal is for the workout. So going into it, knowing that like 15 was the number I had in my head, and knowing just how physiology works, like it pays to get a little bit ahead without crossing that line too early and just yeah. pray that you can get to your line. Like I was pretty happy with the execution at the end. Like, I don't think I stood around too much at no point were you coaxing me where I was like, no, no like I'm fine. Well, give me a minute. Give me a minute. I felt like the execution yeah. was like, you know, you tell me to drop the barbell. I step back for a second. And then eventually you're like, stand by the barbell. And I think for the rest of the workout, I basically did that. So yeah, uh, I was I actually happy with found it. that at the highest level, that was a huge differentiator again these these workouts looked exactly the same it's like these people are going to get the same score and it's like this this person got 35 clean and jerks because they kept doing the the you know the magical thing joe carney would do where he could drop a barbell in front one inch in front of his shin and have it just sit there somehow Uh, (laughs) what a weird skill to have but like the people that were doing that they looked again like the cadence looked so similar but there was no that time of backing up and then waiting, and then stepping forward, the backing up and the stepping forward just wasn't part of it. Yeah, I mean, it's no different than, you know, thinking about your setup in event two, or one, excuse me, with the rower and the box and the barbell. Like, if you take two extra steps, or for some reason you think it's a better idea to walk to the far corner of the box, to the corner that's closest to the rower, you just lose one and a half seconds here, two seconds there. And then you look at the leaderboard at the end of the weekend, you're like, fuck, I was five to seven reps behind the best that could be it right there. Just silly little stuff like that. So, you know, it does take a good reminder once in a while to have that discipline, be like, Hey, someone's going to remind you like, Hey, you're wasting two to three extra seconds. You do not need, you're not going to feel light and <laughs> night and day better from taking one or two steps back and a couple steps forward. So just stay there and be disciplined to pick the bar back up. And I do think that made a difference because, you know, I gave myself a chance to get a few more reps than last time. And, you know, I was happy with how that played out at the end. Like, I don't really know how that stack up stacks up to the field and I still don't know because the leaderboard's not active, but like <laughs> I knew going into yesterday's retest that like I could do better and I'd be kicking myself if at the end of the weekend, even though I don't have aspirations to compete much beyond semifinals, it'd be cool to make semifinals and I'd be kicking myself if it were fucking right. two cleaning jerks where you know, yeah. be tough for 30 more seconds and you get that number. So it was, I was happy with that. And I think it was a, a good workout, obviously a little bit different for me than, you know, the Austins of the world who are probably 
closer to like, all right, let's do 245 grace <laughs> real quick here. Yeah. But it was, it was, I thought it was a fun workout. It was a good test. I mean, I'm very happy it was 245 versus 275. I would have probably gotten like five or six reps if it was 275 versus 245. So it was just a better test for me because it's a weight I can still move somewhat consistently. Well, and that's why like this workout's probably the top one that comes to mind when we're thinking about um, competing as a skill because some people, again, we've, we've addressed this in the past, will train all year long and get lulled into like they train alone. They, don't, they, they never have training partners or they're never comparing scores with online training partners and they get, they get pulled back into, well, this hurts a little, <laughs> so that means that I went hard enough to make an adaptation. And unfortunately, like there's a lot of workouts in CrossFit, competitive CrossFit that you can half-ass that still hurt anyways. Um, so for me, that means like, again, if these workouts are looking similar, one of the things could be that competitive element of like, we addressed it earlier with like, actually your grip's probably fucking fine. Hold on to the dumbbells. Like you're uncomfortable. Okay. Sorry. Like, so what? That's how I think about this workout in knowing what it's like to have someone drag you along in a workout that first time in a while that you do it, you know, you cut we have athletes that, you know, follow the program that live all over the world. They'll come to visit and they get that opportunity. If we've got, you know, a little mini training camp going of getting pulled along in workouts and they're just like, Whoa, like I didn't know I was capable of that. I haven't felt that shitty in God knows how long. Um, and that's what can be the separator in a workout like this. Like you're doing it, you're in the moment, it hurts pretty bad. Um, and the problem is you took two or three extra seconds on each rep that you shouldn't have. And you multiply that over each rep and over the course of four or five minutes. And that's the only reason that you didn't do better. Well, what's funny is like I knew, you know, doing it here, I'm doing it with some of my buddies and like it's for fun. And most of it are just, you know, doing the quarterfinals because, hey, it's cool to say you made quarterfinals. When I was doing the workout, I got done and I was, you know, I felt pretty terrible, but I was like, I could go harder. And there was no one here to be like, go again. Like the, the yeah. only person I know in the gym that would yell at me to go again faster was on vacation. So I was like, if I, <laughs> it's just, he was just on, you know, April break. So he's on vacation. Yeah. So I knew that if I came into yes, uh, yesterday at the gym, that if you were a hunter were around, and if I asked one of you to count for me, that you wouldn't let me take that extra two seconds I do not need, yeah. that doesn't really right. make anything different, that would keep me accountable. And like, there are workouts where that person can push you into making a poor choice because they care about you and they want to see you do well. And that may not be yeah. the best strategy, but in a workout right. like that, where like the barbells in a percentage that you can move steadily, but you're just going to want to take that extra one or two seconds that doesn't help. You need that person to be like, all right, pick the fucking bar up again. Just do it yeah. again. And it was nice to, you know, not only be told that, but to like realize that like, if I put my hands on my knees for one extra second or I took a step away from the barbell, it didn't make it feel any better. So just have someone to be that person that goes, go again, three, two, one, go again. And it just, you know, ends up being someone pushing you to that limit. Because if you were really looking to see what you could do in this workout, you should be coming, you should be flirting dangerously close to failure by the end of the workout. Like at the yeah. end of the workout, like those jerks start to get a little sketchy or you catch a power clean a little lower than you thought because you're pushing that capacity. You're not just like looking like you're doing a fucking nice afternoon EMOM at every 30 seconds doing one rep. Like, so I think I got to that point yesterday and that's what, you know, what you need every once in a while if you're unable to create it yourself. And you know, for me, I typically do better if someone is holding me accountable, especially when I'm feeling sad with a heavy barbell or like a high heart rate. Well, I, the nuance of the difference in the workouts <laughs> is important here. I think you doing them in Wyndham, the first three workouts doing them in Wyndham, a lot of opportunities in those workouts to be baited by somebody else into an incorrect strategy. Whereas you might want to get baited in the final one. <laughs> you might want to have like some of that fucking bravado of like, fuck that. How did they finish that, you know, window that fast and that sort of thing. Like that's the kind of workout that requires some level of that. And I've just watched you work out 10,000 fucking times since mm. 2011 or 12, whatever it is. So like I can serve as that in certain examples of knowing like, if you had started to back off in a way that it would have trended you back towards 12 reps, I would have been like, what the fuck are you doing? Let's go. Yeah. Like that sort of thing. But I think it's, that's another element here of like, 
I felt that some athletes, um, especially out in the gym that were doing workout number three, that was one of those ones where like strategy wise, if you got baited at all, like <laughs> that guy end your fucking workout. So <laughs> the over. nuance of knowing when those things can be good. Um, and when those things can not be so great. Yeah. I think the, you know, Brian and I have been comparing scores through quarterfinals and like after he had done the first three, he wasn't super stoked, but he was doing this workout and he sends me his score and he just said 14 cause I had sent him my score before and I wrote him back. I'm like, cool. I'm going to, I'm going to try to beat that. And he's like, why, why are you doing it again? And it's like, because you just showed me it was possible. Like, and that's one of the beauties of having yeah, training partners. Like if you can fucking do it and you believe in yourself enough, you say, fuck that. I'll try. What's, what is the worst that could happen if I didn't do that workout yesterday? Is right. that regret the entire year of like, fuck, I could have done three more of those. So fuck, you do it. And if you fail, who, you know, everyone would fucking forget. I'm not going to ask Drew, hey, remember what I got for cleaning jerks on fucking February 22nd, 2024, two years from now? You have no fucking idea. Only person going to know is you. So, you know, I think you use training partners to show you what's possible. You share scores with the people that you trust and you, you know, you're your fellow homies when it comes to training. So they show you what's possible and help you see what you could do, but don't get wrapped up in the fact that like you <laughs> are your score you know athletes comp like a lot of times attach value to that when they're in this part of the year but you know you, you if you execute the way that you can and you do your absolute best and you don't leave anything on the table like you have to be proud of your effort and realize that like you don't get to unfortunately dictate the length of your journey like you just get to keep plugging away so um and i was happy with having that shown as a possibility and then just uh, you know overall having an opportunity to to do it again and do a little better if you, as a competitor, observe a gap in what you did in your performance and what is possible to do in your performance and you don't do anything about it, like that's very uncompetitive of you. Like you saw that gap. Now you have to then reverse engineer, like what was it? Because it could have been the thing that we talked about that you need to push a little bit harder, or it could be that you were moving like shit. Like I saw a lot of people, their first muscle up and workout number three, the first muscle up of each set because they were blown up, no backswing, no kip of the dip. They had to get to the top of a muscle up to then get a big backswing and remind themselves to do that probably because I was screaming at them for, <laughs> for so many strict dips, so many strict dips out on the oh, gym yeah. floor. Oh my goodness. Terrifying. But again, you observe the gap. You watch the training partner that that you know that you could probably beat in this workout or you lost to him by two minutes and it should only have been 30 seconds. You have to then go back and say, okay, was it pacing? Was it movement efficiency? Was it just me not wanting to suffer? Like you have to figure out what the reason was. Um, but that's one thing that like comparing yourself to only yourself um, is tough because like subjective objective like in the moment yeah. of when you're really feeling like shit is not going to be the easiest thing in the world to audit like we all no matter what quote unquote how tough you are are going to go there at certain moments within a metcon yeah all right i, I think it's oh go ahead, go ahead Drew. no you're good no, i was just going to echo what you said i think i think looking in that something like that like at at some point you you know you're as only as fit as you're going to be. But the important part here, and I think the number one message you should take home from this is like, did you do your homework ahead of time? And did you spend enough time thinking through everything to maximize your current potential fitness? Which I think, unfortunately, we still see athletes who have tremendous fitness not take the extra time to really dig into something and think about it before they do it. Because they just, you know, like instincts will kick in and I'll do my best. And a lot of times that like, like you said earlier, like if I had done these workouts in Port Portland, I might've got baited into a strategy just cause you know, they're my homies and I like working out with them. Right. That yeah. doesn't necessarily work well for testing. Great for training, but not ideal for testing. Very true. So obviously we are now at a point where basically everyone's season has ended. Um, mm -hmm. There are very few people on earth when we go based on percentages um, that get to continue to compete. We did an entire episode on um, that, that published last week that is about what we are planning for our athletes, what we're doing. Um, but unintentionally, I mean, I knew it would happen, but unintentionally, s everything that we're doing in Hatchet Off Season 1, um, which is starting on Monday, April 29th at MisfitAthletics.com, is like 
like we we talked about like hey we got to get your mobility better every single day has a hold um to, to get you into the positions that we need to get you the stability that you need every single day has the option of being on the strength bias track because number four is what knocked you out or for most people the conditioning bias track um which obviously is is a lot more about workouts one and two um but taking the time to audit these workouts and you know what like almost everyone that I've gone in, you know, I keep tabs on the misfits, like staggering improvements from people. If you look at their worldwide scores in the opening mm -hmm. quarterfinals from last year, this year, um, which is always fantastic to see, but that's when the basis of comparison goes back to you. Like when you're competing, you're trying to beat everybody else. When you're in the off season, it's like, okay, whether I finished 10 spots above or below where I wanted to. Um, what is it about my performance? What did I learn from this year that will allow me to move forward? So like whether you thought it was a success, whether you thought it was a failure, you now have a baseline. You've drawn a line in the sand and said, can I go above that? And it could be any number of these things that we talked about on this podcast. Um, but the great thing is being able to do the strength bias track or the conditioning bias track and then choose your personalized skill progressions it's going to address every single thing that we talked about in this podcast couldn't agree more my only word of note is do not get tempted by how many options there are and trying to do all of them i think that's something that really happens this time of year like i'm sure if you sit down with a pen and paper you can write out things that went well things that didn't go well and then have an honest conversation but with yourself about what actually needs to be addressed and don't try to fix 400 things at once in the first week of the programming like go in with a mindset of like all right well i clearly realize that i lack grip strength and my squat mobility sucks and i need some interval work so i do the bitch work i do the accessory and i call it a day because i'm setting myself up for a longer See, I have a long time between now and next February. There's a shitload of time. And I, if you get overzealous and cram things in at the beginning, you're gonna get overwhelmed, you're gonna get hurt, you're gonna get sick, and it's gonna derail you. And the consistency factor is what ultimately determines your success and your adherence to doing the things that you need to be doing. So, you know, if you haven't heard it once, you've heard it 12,000 times, 12 million times, don't think about doing more, think about doing things better and use the options you have in front of you to address what you need and do them to the best of your ability. Yeah, I think one of the things we try really hard to do in the entire off season, including the summer and then once everybody's back on board in the fall is to show you how you're progressing because the mindset of I'm here now and I'm going to broad jump my way to exactly who I'm going to be next March um, is very challenging. You Good ride luck. the wave <laughs> all year long. Like, I don't know how I'm doing. I hope I'm getting better. I'm so fucking stressed about how fit I'm going to be in March and you're not noticing what's going on there. And like, again, you're riding the wave of the high highs and the low lows throughout the course of the year. You need to be like, like stand up, and put one foot, one foot length in front of the other and visually think about what that is and then slide the other one up and then slide it forward and then slide the other one next to it. We're taking these tiny steps over the course of an entire year. So if you do what Sherb is asking you to do, you're taking those steps, you're observing how you're improving while you're doing it. And you realize that like, man, if I'm doing squat holds and I actually commit to doing this for 10 months, what kind of position am I going to be able to get in at the bottom of a wall ball for it to be super easy and then for me to be able to stay super low on top of the box in a burpee box jump over? You just bought yourself a minute on that workout doing squat holds. Like that is not a more is better situation. That's drop your ass down into the bottom of a squat basically every day for five minutes and see how it changes your fitness. Like how could it change my fitness? You'll find out. Better is better, not more. And again, I couldn't agree with you more. It's gonna show its head in more than one spot. And if you stay present and you're hyper aware of how you're improving, that should be all the fuel you need to realize that like, if I keep doing this day in and day out, the leaderboard will show the difference next year. And I've, I've had athletes that do that, you know, that just plugged away with the same thing consistently day after day after day after day. And then they get a chance to do strict handstand pushups in a workout and it doesn't fuck up their muscles at the end and they get a baller to score on event three. 
It's like, hey, the handstand holds you did in fucking October are the reasons why you were able to do the muscle ups at the end of that event. Good job. Keep doing that stuff. Uh, we're going to do a fun little uh, Easter egg uh, situation here. We've been talking about quarterfinals for 90 minutes. Um, I'm going to give some shit away and shout out the misfits simultaneously. Um, I just, the buy-in into the programming and into being supportive of the community and giving a shit about yourself and your scores, the amount of DMs that I got. Hey, I'm thinking about this super thoughtful questions people were asking in terms of strategy, in terms of order. Um, I really love uh, one of the things that we talk about um, internally as being a part of our own community and not just observing it. Um, and I can tell you it was a pretty incredible experience. And then proud papa moment when I go in and click through the names of the people who have been in touch with me throughout the course of the year. And it's jumping 50 spots, 100 spots, 200, 300 spots Super on leaderboards. Cool. It's so awesome to see. So the first three people who DM me either on Discord or Instagram. I am at Misfit Coach on all three. And uh, write the word cornucopia. Um, I will send you some fuck free sharpened the X. Yeah. Is, the, is the emoji in there? I'm using the emoji. Does it have to be does it have to be spelled correctly for them to win? Cornucopia. Cornucopia. I don't know how you spell so, that fucking word. Thank you. <laughs> slash congratulations. Send me a DM. I'll send you some free shit from Sharpen the Axe. Everybody else, head to sharpentheaxecode.com. Use your favorite athlete code. You save 10%. The athletes get 10% towards their journey to semifinals and hopefully beyond. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Misfit Podcast. And yeah, teammisfit.com. Brand new affiliate phase, affiliate programming phase starts basically right now today. Same thing, Hatchet Off Season 1, misfitathletics.com. Choosing between the strength track or the conditioning track. We'll see you next week.